Okay, great. Thanks, Nate. Um, we have a packed agenda tonight, so I want to move along as quickly as I can, or as we can. Uh, the first item was announcements, and I have only one announcement, which also kind of belongs further down on the agenda, but I'll announce it now anyway. And that is that uh, we have received a promise, and maybe a check is in the mail, I don't know, from the Interfaith Housing Corporation. They are going to uh, give us $10,000 uh, specifically to be spent on the Belchertown Road East Street development, which is particularly helpful since we're going to have some expenses that cannot be covered by Community Preservation Act funds, particularly related to maintaining the property uh, before a developer takes it over. So that's uh, good for us. Uh, and uh, actually, I was going to move that uh, we send a, uh, a letter of thanks on behalf of the entire trust uh, to Rob Ryan, who's the chair, and actually to the entire Interfaith Housing Corporation board. So uh, I can say I so move. Any, is there a second? Second. I second it. Thank you for answering this. Uh, so is there discussion? <laughs> Do people want to know more than I've said here? Like, what is the Interfaith Housing Corporation? <laughs> Yeah, you know, John, the check was actually received today. So it's uh Okay. Yeah. So it's a done deal. Oh yeah. Just yeah. requires required. you to deposit it and then ice cream all around. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> uh, for people who don't know, the Interfaith Housing Corporation was established, I think probably around 30 years ago. I can't give it an exact date. Maybe Nate will know. Um they had invested in affordable housing um, in Amherst that became a, a specific development. And was it Village Park? It was Village Park. Village Park, right. Anyway, uh, the Village Park had a 30-year life. And at the end of it, I believe it was sold. And so all the groups that have invested in it uh, received money. And the interfaith group decided to hold on to their money and look for opportunities to invest in new affordable housing. A significant amount of the money actually was invested in Craig's doors, but uh, it went to establish and maintain the shelter for a number of years. And then they pulled out of that because that was not what they wanted to do. Uh, I know they've given some money to Valley Community Development, and now they're giving some money to us, which is very timely. Okay, so we'll vote, since I see Carol already has her thumbs up. And I'll, we need to have a voice vote, or not a voice vote, but a, an individual vote. So I'll begin with Carol. Yes. Okay. Erica? Yes. Rob? Yes. Uh, is Will on yet? He's not. Okay. Not yet. He will be on. Francis? Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Sid? Yes. Allegra? Allegra? She's muted. <laughs> there yes. you go. Sorry, I pressed <laughs> the wrong button. <laughs> okay. Actually, you can stay unmuted as long as there's not a dog or a baby in the background. Uh, I think Paul hasn't joined us. And so the only other person is me, and I vote yes. So that's uh, seven yeses with two people not available. OK, so we'll move on. It looks like uh, two, uh, Laura Baker has her hand raised, and Nina does too. Oh, to talk about this? I'm not sure, but her hands are raised. OK, Laura? Hey, Laura, you can unmute yourself. Hey, John, you had asked me to join tonight uh, to make an announcement. So I figured this is the announcement's time and I should raise my hand. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, 
So uh, just to let the group know that the project at 132 Northampton Road, the Amherst Supportive Studio Apartments project was given its first bit of state funding in the form of 10 um, <laughs> rental subsidies that will be targeted to tenants who are homeless at that property. So it's a good sign. Um, we await the balance of the requested state funds, which are all the capital dollars. Um, we anticipate announcements coming in June. So we will of course keep you posted, but there was a press release and then people thought it was, it was good news. And some people thought it was better news than it was. They thought it was all the money. So I just said, I would come and clarify that it is good news, but it's not the final piece of funding that we need. And since you're talking about it, I will um, echo what John said, which is the Interfaith Housing Corporation also gave a grant to the 132 Northampton Road project as well. So they're doing good works all around. Great. That's it. Thanks, Laura. And Nina? Um, I just had a question that I'd like. Oh, sorry. Did you, um, Whoops. She just went away somehow. I need are you. Can you start over again? What? Can you start all over again? We missed. Okay. What you were yeah, I just had. I, I I just was had a question about um, the project that the ten thousand dollars is is going to the Bel the Belcher Town Road project. Okay. Well, we're going to talk about that as the, I think the third agenda item. Okay. I'm so sorry. why don't you hold okay. off until we get to that point? Thank oh, you. Perfect. Okay. Okay, so before that, we wanted to talk about the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, and Janet Tetroff has nicely agreed to join us this evening to talk about where we are and where we're headed. Hi, everybody. Hello. And right, I'm sharing uh, the screen. Hey. If people can, if that's visible. Can you make it any bigger? Oh, Thank well, you. Well, that's. How's that? <laughs> you can see my giant typo where I spelled April wrong. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a hurry, obviously. Um, so this is uh, an update as of to as of today. Um, it not much has changed since my last update on March tenth. Um, so at this point, we've had 109 applications um, since, for, since the beginning of round two. That includes um, a couple from about six from round one. And then we've actually had a few phone applications recently. So folks who are just calling uh, Community Action for assistance and the staff are identifying that they live in Amherst and they might be eligible for this program. So they're sort of bypassing the online pre-application, which is totally fine in a lot of ways, a little bit easier. Um, we did, I did, there was one included last time that I actually ended up removing because I realized that it was a landlord that was applying on behalf of her tenant and her tenant had also applied. So I took her out, um, very confused because I couldn't find her application anywhere. And I was like, what happened to this person? And then it turns out it was landlord. So uh, we went from, Basically, we had added three new applications since my last uh, update. Okay, and I noticed a couple of contrasts between round one and round two, which I think are all interesting. At this point, you have no backlog to speak of. Uh, the number complete and awaiting review is zero, which yeah. has not been the case typically in the past. Uh, there's nothing pending, waiting for an appointment. So basically, you're all caught up. Yeah, there's we some have, in process, right? Yeah. There's Whatever eight that, means. that we call that are in process, meaning okay. that a decision hasn't been made either because the application's not complete or the advocate is still actively working with the applicant. So um, there are still eight that are somewhere in the process. But, okay, but that's um, a pretty small number. It's a pretty small number. Um, it's been, you know, I said to John and Nate, it's been pretty quiet. Um, that's not typically terribly unusual for this time of the year uh, because people get their tax refunds back. Um, also this year, people got, several, lots of people got the third round of the stimulus checks, which was $1,400 a person. Um, 
so depending on your household side, this could have been, you know, a decent amount of funds. So we tend to be a little bit quieter during this time because some people who are getting their tax refunds are able to resolve their issue or catch up on bills. A lot of people use their tax return for that. Um, but, you know, it, uh, I think part of what we wanted, John wanted to talk about tonight is just, you know, whether or not to extend the contract past June 30th, given the sort of landscape of where we are with the program. Do you have numbers for the last three months, month by month for the number of applications? I do. So in January, we had four applications. In February, we had four. And in March, we had five. Okay, so the numbers are really down from what they had been. Correct. If you look at the contrast between round one, uh, well, if you look at the round two, the total applications is 109. Yes. So most of those occurred in 2020. Yes, most of them occurred in September, October, November, Dece December. You know, December, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, those numbers, sorry, those four, four and five, or whatever it was, were those, those are just applications received, not that they were approved, right? Correct, that's applications received, yep. Mm. So the reason why this is important is because as Janice said, uh, the contract between the town and community action ends on June 30th. And the question is, should we let it run out with no action? Or should we uh, be thinking about extending it beyond uh, June 30th? And that would require writing a new contract into the next town fiscal year. And uh, I, I have to say, honestly, looking at the numbers that Jana just reported for applications in January, February, and March, I'm thinking that um, we've done very well with this program, but we've done what we can do. And people should be relying on uh, RAFT, which is a much more generous program. And uh, in this area, it's managed by Wayfinders. They have ramped up, so they are presumably processing applications much more efficiently. And I know that Community Action, as well as others, have been referring to uh, Wayfinders. So that's where we are. Discussion? Um, this is Carol. I'm, it seems it makes sense uh, if right now there aren't a lot more applications to not try to like string it out right now. I guess we know how to do this and it feels to me like I still am waiting for the other shoe to drop. I am still waiting for people to stop being able to use the stuff that they've got for things to run out and for and for kind of all hell to break loose. But it seems to me that we could let this stop in June. Johnny, you can tell me if this is crazy. And if things got horrible in September, it wouldn't be that hard to start it again because we it's in place. We kind of know how to do it. Maybe community action wouldn't have the staff to do it anymore. I don't know. But it seems like stopping in June is fine. But I'm not sure that the need isn't going to suddenly come back when something that we don't quite know what it is yet happens and, and what people have been able to rely on isn't there anymore. Yeah, I mean, I think community actions, you know, exhausted their contract and, you know, to, con con to continue it to me seems beyond the scope of what it was originally for. You know, this was emergency rental assistance and, you know, I think we've served that purpose. If there's remaining funds, I feel like, I agree, Carol, we could, we could make uh, tweaks to a program and then, Try it again. I mean, the trust have been talking about doing a local voucher or subsidy program. So I think we have, you know, we have the, the start of something. If we needed to um, continue it later, we could, you know, we have a foundation now. So I feel like, you know, just to be fair to community action, I don't want to extend it without offering. I mean, at some point we, you know, I'd have to see how long and how much we've extended the contract because at some point it's just, you know, we can't extend it indefinitely, John. We can't just say, okay, we, yeah. We're, you know, we're doing this for six months and all of a sudden it's a two-year contract. And so I feel like it's run its course and, 
um, if we wanted to, if even if we want to start it again early, you know, in July or, or whatever, or September, we could, you know, I feel like we'd have to come up with a new scope of services and. Right, exactly. Well, um, again, we, it's fine to take no action this month. We can revisit it next month and see if there's a, been a jump up in applications during the month of April. Uh, you know, that just means that Jana would have to send a note to Nate and I telling us whether that's happened or not, and we'd report it back to everybody. My guess is that won't happen, uh, but as I said, if it does, we can revisit this issue in May. So we don't need to take a vote if we're not going to, if, if we're basically de facto choosing not to take action right now. And I'll just, I mean, we've spent, you've spent $83,000, which is a lot of money. I mean, I think that the town should be really proud of itself. Yeah. You know, that's not nothing. That's a lot of money that went out to households in need. So even though it wasn't the $300,000 that you thought we were going to spend, you know, $83,000 is still a significant um, resource that. Absolutely. And we've helped 43 households. There'll be a few more between now and the end of June. Um, I've noticed that the largest number of households have uh, four individuals or more. So we're clearly yeah. serving the people we hope to serve. Uh, so I think all that's really good. Yeah, if you see of the approved applications, um, there are 17 or 40% are for households with a size of four or more. Yeah. So I agree. I think I think we should uh, declare victory. As Jana said, I think we've done what we intended to do. Maybe it's not quite as large as we expected or we hoped, um, but it's still very good. Okay, well, we will keep working until June 30th. If I can just chime in, I, I think, I was just gonna say, I think it's, it's hey, Erica, I think you're freezing, Erica. We can't hear you. Uh, yeah, she froze. Sorry, it's probably my internet. Okay, we can hear you now. I was just going to say, I think the issue is more, I think what Carol was saying, which is the fear that we have not reached people who really needed this. Um, but I think, you know, we've tried everything. And I'm just wondering if other towns around us um, have, you know, found the same thing, which is that we've really wanted to reach as many people as we can. And we're sort of, I think, anxious that we might not have, but I think we've tried everything. Yeah, I think we've done a very good job of outreach. I can certainly ask MHP whether or what they know about the experience because there were literally something like 80 other local programs that were started in the state. Uh, the other programs that are really local like East Hampton or Hadley were much slower to get off the ground. Uh, but nonetheless, we can find the answer to your question, Erica. I can do that query. It's not that hard. That'd be cool. I think, I mean, Janet, uh, Community Action also administered other communities, right? And so I, I've spoken with a few communities and they had a similar um, outcome as Amherst where, you know, they didn't have as many um, applicants as they thought. So, you know, it's also true of um, business grants and loans. So, you know, the town, we're doing a microenterprise program for, you know, businesses with five or fewer employees and, you know, other communities are having trouble getting the number of businesses they thought that would be applying for support. And so I'm just not, you know, it's interesting. I think the words getting out there may just be, especially with some of these programs, it is a lot of paperwork and a lot of information is required and it's just not something uh, you know, people are used to. I mean, I, I mean, I feel like this, you know, just that could just be a barrier. It's a perception. Uh, Okay, well, we'll check back in May. 
I think I'm going to say we're done with this agenda item. And as I've said earlier, we got others to move on to. And I want to move on to right now, unless someone has a last comment, to the discussion of the draft RFP. All right, well, then I'm going to say good night. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for all you've done, Jana. Have a great night. Okay, so we're on to the draft RFP. Uh, it's pretty lengthy. I don't know if we want to put it on on the board. Uh, yeah, I have it up. I guess it's. Um, I can do that. I can I can share it. Um, okay. You can try to navigate it. Okay, and we can try to march through it page by page and see if people have particular concerns. We can note those. Um, but at the end of the day, my hope is that we would vote to recommend this uh, or to say this is indeed the RFP that we want to see, with the exception that there are a few things missing that should be filled in by Nate or other people at Town Hall. Yeah, I think the... Um... You know, staff needs to look at it just so you know the trust knows that the trust would recommend this document to the town and then the town staff would advise the town manager um you know and that would uh it would it would go out through you know through the town manager and um i feel like we still you know the things i'd like to do after this document's done is we have a we have a website for the east street school we can update it with belcher town road and i'd like to just put as many documents as we have and just consolidate what we have um, online, which hasn't happened yet. Just make sure we have everything, you know, taken care of and anticipate any questions that would be asked uh, during the process, just so we have a smooth, <laughs> as smooth a process as we can hope. And Nate, there were a couple of sections that um, we had noted for you to complete there was some yeah, those are all there. noted out in the margins. Yeah, so you and or Rob. Or John Page, yep. where they're highlighted in yellow. Right. So they'll be obvious as we go through. Right. Anything on the first couple of pages that anybody had? I guess one question is, you know, we had, um, I just want to make sure, you know, how, what's the, I forget what the time frame is. Like, how long are we offering for, res for responses? Or is that not decided? Uh, we didn't make that decision. Um, since it's a somewhat complicated procurement, I would think um, we would allow maybe 45 days. Or 60 days. 60, yeah, 60 days. days. That's yeah. what I was thinking. Okay. Yeah. I will take Rita's advice on that, as I often do. <laughs> I just think it gives time both, um, you know, for bidders to put information together, but also if there are questions that come up, that we have, you know, adequate time to respond for people to then mm -hmm. process that response. No, I agree. Yeah, the worst would be to well, even at sixty, we may have to extend it. But I'd hate to cut mm -hmm. it short, knowing we'd have to just amend the right. whole, whole right. thing anyways. Leave it longer. Yeah. Okay. No, I mean, I think you know, I don't. We just want to update this web page and. Right. So um, what we want to do is put, again, as much information, kind of all the updated um, wetlands information, the hazardous materials evaluation for East Street, um, wetlands uh, information for Belchertown Road. And then there were plans, you know, on East Street, uh, you know, we had we put up a bunch of stuff when the right. building was going to be used for LSSE. Um, there was a bunch of, inf you know, uh, some preliminary architectural stuff, just useful things about building measurements and so forth. Yeah. So that would all be put on a separate. Yep. Was yeah. that going to be now the, the, whatever we're calling this, the build your town East street road projects will all be in one place for both. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 
Yeah, I should say that uh, Rita's done most of the drafting, um, starting with the base of what had been the RFP for E Street, uh, basically 18 months ago. But when she drafted it, it really was with the advice and I think consent of our RFP committee that included Carol, Erica, and Francis all have put in quite a bit of time. I think we met uh, on four evenings over the last four months. The group also included myself and John Page as well as Rita. So there's been a lot of thinking that's gone into this and a lot of debate about what to include. Well, and, and also just clarification um, that will show up here. So really good questions from the, um, you know, from the, the subcommittee members. And then just looking at natural gas, we're, um, we note it and then you say developers responsible for all your connections. So I think, you know, though we do say Berkshire gas, I'm not sure that they would allow a new connection. Yeah. So that is just, again, information that we need you to update. Yeah. I don't, I don't know anything about it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we have a developer who has a connection on a property and they're trying to get them to allow uh, it's equivalent usage probably, but a different use. And they're talking with Berkshire Gas to see if they would allow it. And I'm not sure they will. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah. I mean, it would even use less gas than the previous use um, because it's a new, whole new, you know, building and they're not sure they would even let the meter connection stay. Yeah, so we had a footnote the last time, again, that yeah. should just be updated. Mm -hmm. From an environmental point of view, we may want these buildings to be all electric in any case. Yeah, I mean, what I found out with like some of the newer ones, they at least have, they'll have gas sometimes for hot water. So they'll, the heat and everything will be all electric, um, but then they might have so, another fuel for hot water just to accommodate that demand. So I think all this is um, good. I can look back to the E Street School one, but I think the footnote went to nowhere. I think yeah. it was a, a reference, but it, there was never an explanation. <laughs> so we might need to take a look at that. Footnote to nowhere. Yeah, and you know, no, we do. I was just looking at that town's right to recreation lands. I guess that's one thing too. I just was right. noting the. Yeah. You know, right, what are we going to say about that? that the that's access all been, to, yeah, yeah, that's all been noted for you to to for yeah. you to update. I'm not sure we have a good answer, you know, uh, you know, I mean, I, we have ideas, but I, I don't. So I something needs to be decided before we do the RFP that right. the trust is not gonna mm -hmm. decide. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, buildings on the site too, let me just. Nate, I think we gave if you a anybody list. on the trust has any questions, please jump in. Yeah. You, you don't need to raise your hand. If there's anybody among the observers, if you have a question, please raise your hand so we can recognize you. Okay, so I mean, here's where it gets into the more the more prescriptive elements, you know, the number of units and the affordability. And we think that's all workable. Um, and the 40 units, that's between both sites, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. What we didn't do anywhere was um, prescribe uh, a range, a unit range on right. either one of the sites. And I, and I think we should leave that to the developers. Right, right, the breakdown per of units per site. Right. Mm -hmm. Do it didn't occur to me until you just said that, but do we wouldn't want one site to have all of the anything, right? I mean, both sites should contain some kind of mixture of whatever there is. We do we would want that, would we not? Yes, we do. Yes. Do we have to say that somehow so that you don't have all of the, I don't know what, afford the 
like all three bed, like all three bedrooms. Yeah. So you have all the big ones someplace, and all the little ones, or all the all the thirty percent ones together, and none of them somewhere else. And I didn't even think of this until what Rita just said. But there might want to be something in here, like we said that uh, um, <clears throat> each size of housing should have some mix of affordability, and maybe also each site should have some reasonable mix of something or other. Well, maybe where we have F, we could add a G immediately below it, saying essentially that both sites should contain a mix of the various types of housing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's a good idea. Hi, this is Francis. Just to quickly look at the other side of that. I don't know, just thinking about like the East Street, the school, for example, it might be difficult to put in like three bedrooms or plus bedroom units. Um, schools usually go to smaller uh, size departments. I mean, I think since we're not designing it, I think it's hard to say. I mean, maybe we can say we would uh, like to have diversity of obviously incomes and uh, a unit mix in both, but I don't, I don't think we should like tell them oblige them to do it because it just might be difficult from a design perspective good point we're trying to give the developers as much flexibility as we can and we do have the the issue with the belchertown road site that it's um maxed out at 100 percent area median income because of the acquisition with CPA funds so yeah i i think i agree with francis i think we leave it vague um did we say i missed it did we say that the belchertown road site is capped at 100 ami it's it's in there it is yeah just, yeah. You just <laughs> somewhere <laughs> yeah not a number of times mm -hmm. yeah it's in there a few times yes. yeah it's in there so did that mean we are going to add a g but leave it kind of yes. we would prefer blah yeah. blah or something yeah. but not yeah. that it's required okay so you okay. want to add you want to have something okay Mm -hmm. So D is another um, the public access here. That's for you, Nate. Yeah, and then um, it made me think that um, you know, Dave had mentioned that you know the Belchertown Road site. Is adjacent to the Fort River Farm Conservation Area, but I don't know, you know, how much how much discussion there's been about having a, a direct connection from that property to the conservation area. But uh, I know it's been mentioned. Um, I just write that down too. That would be nice. Well, the right. question is, does Dave Zomek feel that he wants to promise that? If not, then we really can't put it in this document. Yeah, I mean, you know, there, there could be some wetland crossing issues and it may be more complicated. So it's just, oh, okay. is, it, Got is, it. It, is it a requirement or, you know, it's just, I just want to make a note of it because it could just be something for staff to talk about and see what, you know, does it become a town, um, uh, you know, something the town investigates more. So I know G is, is, um new and I believe that's new to the we didn't have this when we previously reviewed this but at the last subcommittee working group um this was added tenant storage space yeah we're gonna put uh, electric vehicle charging stations too <laughs> I know I mean I'm serious I was just talking to someone yeah. and they put that in that recent uh yeah uh, development except I'm not sure how many of our tenants are going to have electric cars mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's in the code for single family houses now for garages. Really? Cool. To be wired for it. Yep. Yeah, be ready. Yeah. To be ready. Yep. I just had a clarifying question about F. Yeah. Would there be offices at both East Street and Belchertown Road, or would it be one office that would ideally address both? I think we say one office, probably. I mean, it would be up to the developer, but it would be hard, I think, for them to 
staff two offices and since the two sites are within a block of each other or maybe two blocks it's not that big a deal i think maybe three blocks but it's clearly walkable it's not that far to get from one to the other i think the way f reads right now it, you know it could be confusing is that well but the development is both sites sites okay oh we defined that somewhere, right? Somewhere mm -hmm. there is some thing that's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's only 36 pages right now. I mean, that's, you know. That's we need good. some more pages, right? <laughs> <laughs> we can say at least one. Do you want me to note that? No, I. I you know, if we, yeah, if we think an on site, an on site management office. Yeah, I, that's fine. That's enough. And then the East Street School building we, we talked about. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the on site management office, they, they, we don't want to overburden the developer with costs. I'd rather have one on site management office and one extra unit. And that was, I was, I was not advocating for two. Management. Right. I was just making sure that I was understanding that the development management was for both sites. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, some of the potential developers have other properties in Amherst. So it's like, you know, do they need an additional office here? But. Uh, I think it's enough units to warrant an office. Sorry, I was just looking at the bedroom. We say 10% here, but up above, did we say 13%? Oh, the, oh, okay, all oh, the affordable units. Sorry, where, where do we have, um, I thought we had a, another percentage for a bedroom. It's, but, uh, it's for three bedroom units. Yeah, that's affordability and the other one is bedrooms. Yeah, for some reason I thought I saw another th a three bedroom calculation somewhere else, but okay, yeah. so. A ten percent. Yeah, I just don't want to be inconsistent, but no, you guys, right? And so this, these bedroom counts are um, include including any market rate units. So the, the ten percent isn't necessarily just affor is affordable units. It's not right. just affordable. Well, units. That's correct. Right. Yeah. Mm. But we did know in D, mix of bedroom sizes shall be included for affordable units. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they yeah, you know, to... All right. Um, so just, you know, one other thing I'd point out for, I know there are some in our audience tonight, some developer, um, developers, potential developers. Um, what we did on the um, management plan is just say submit a manage submit a management plan that you current you currently use for um, affordable rental and just um, make a note as to you know how it might be adapted for this development. So there's no requirement to do a management plan obviously for this development um, specifically. But we want to see a, 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 an example of one and how it might be um, adapted for Belchertown Road East Street School. And then for the LDA, it looks like you know you didn't have a time frame, right? At one point, whatever I thought there was, you know, more time frame in terms of securing permits. Or did, yeah, yeah. So we kind of, you know, I think there were some good comments at the, the last time we sort of. Um, made, uh, we didn't have the kind of strict timelines. We tried to 
take out as much reference to, um, you know, to within 60 days or 90 days or whatever to, to, to allow for the fact that um, particularly around permitting that you just, there's so many unknowns that it's right. hard to, um, to hold, yeah. but. The, the LDA is done um, within, you know, the selection mm -hmm. within 45 days of the designation of the developer. That has nothing to do with the permitting. No, but, I, you know, so at one point it seemed like within the LDA there's going to be, you know, yeah, the LDA, what the LDA does is it should incorporate all the provisions that are in the RFP. So it should reflect what was... Um, what was in the RFP and those deadlines. So if we haven't, I think we edited everything to make it conform to um, uh, to what we have in the in the narrative. But you know, another read through, Nate, by you, <laughs> will not hurt. If there's, I mean, the the yeah. subcommittee's been through it. I've been through it. John's, you know, we've all read this and you know have worked on making sure that there's consistency yeah. throughout. But um, but we've all read it enough times that having somebody read it who hasn't read it so many times exactly. is a really great idea. Exactly. Oh, uh, and then we're and then then a town attorney will read it and they'll have a lot yeah, of comments. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Although, again, a lot of this um, language was already in the East Street School, which was right. edited by um, the town attorney. So yeah, should... no, because it's interesting when we did the East Street School, um, we I think because it was on a. Um, you know, in a current format, we asked them to kind of do like a light read of it because, you know, some of these decisions are a local decision we're making here right. in this. So they don't right. have to, you know, we don't want them to question the number, like for instance, like the percent of affordable units or something. Right. That's not their, that's not their, uh, I mean, they can ask, but really they right. want to make sure that. The no, so those, those, those dates you should be looking at. Mm -hmm. I thought you'd read this six times already, Nate. <laughs> well, you know, the planning department has also been doing a lot of zoning I'm yeah, I'm just... <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> so I think the LDA stuff is um, is pretty dense here. That yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I mean, you know, the subordination piece, sometimes that becomes a negotiation, but I get, think we can leave it. And yeah. Just, yeah. Mm -hmm. So on the additional funds, you know, we need some read from the town about whether or not um, how everybody's feeling about additional CPA funds and or um, the town's TIF. Yeah, I mean, we say it, we say they're available. I think, you know, saying that they may be available, we're not making any promises. You know, that's kind right. of what we used before. Okay. I will say that after the last planning board meeting, um, when we were talking about zoning, an attorney was watching the meeting after and he emailed me and said, oh, my clients may be interested in using the tax incentive and it's a private developer who wouldn't necessarily do affordable units, you know, and said, oh, well, could we be eligible? And I said, yeah, this is the language. If you, if you need it, it's really not a huge threshold. You can it's not guaranteed you have to, you know, then provide information to the town manager. Um, but, you know, yeah, you're essentially, you could, anyone can be eligible for use of the tax incentive. Um, I don't know where it's going, but it surprised me that, you know, that they're asking on behalf of their client. Even if it's not have anything to do with affordability, they might get a tax incentive? No, no, they have to meet the, they have to have, you know, at least 10 units and 10% of the okay. units have to be affordable. So, you know, if you, if any development uh, is tr triggers the town's inclusionary zoning bylaw, they meet the tax incentive threshold. So um, they could essentially, you know, request that of the town. So I, I think it's fair to say, I think it's fine to say something like what's in the last sentence there. Um, so what we're gonna do is, um, insert the um, comparative criteria 
charts right into the RFP narrative. So that's noted in red. Mm -hmm. And that's a document that we've gone through yeah. multiple times now. This was more substantive, right? The yeah, development yeah, team that was new. Yeah, uh, all of this is substantive. Yeah. It, it runs to the content of what they conclude in their proposal. Yeah, I mean, we, I think even for E Street, we talked about how do we, you know, we'd like to have more description of that, just say, you know, who's in the firm. We actually want to know who's on the development team, you know, more specifically their role and other things. So I, yeah, that's all good. There's a lot here. Um, I saw we want, you know, I think electronic copy, you said, you know, on the USB is one paper copy and one electronic copy. Is that? You know, I think the biggest thing for the trust is making sure that when the proposals come in, that they get copies of it right away. Well, I guess we have to talk about that. Who's, how is it being reviewed? I mean, typically we wouldn't have an entire trust review. No, I. Right, but I think people will want to see it. It's already in here, and it's really up to the town manager to decide who the review committee is. So we put something in here, mm -hmm. and um, I know the last time that was that was changed. So mm -hmm. to what we the trust originally anticipated. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the rest of this is pretty much boilerplate, except for the comparative criteria. Yeah. So that's where the proposal oh, process is there. This, right. Yeah. 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 I just wanna, yeah. Mm -hmm. So does that mean we don't have to go through all the rest of the however many pages of this? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of it are the appendices coming up, which are all standard forms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Design standards was a big discussion, but I, I kind of lost where that was in our narrative here. Maybe we skipped Wait, what, over it. One? John, what did you say? The we design we, standards? Oh, yeah. We had only some vague language regarding design standards. It's probably in the comparative criteria, but the town really doesn't have any active design standards. If they did, then we would have referred to them, but we definitely made a decision not to create those within this RFP. So yeah, there we, really isn't much said about design. The town does have design review principles in the zoning bylaw uh, and they regulate you know, things like massing, scale, uh, they're not that prescriptive or detailed, but. Well, we said a little bit about that, right? Yeah, yeah. and also DHCD has its own design standards. Yeah. So, and those are, are pretty specific. Mm -hmm. And we reference those in the RFP. Yeah, this is all just kind of. Boilerplate. Boilerplate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Reward. And just the development agreement. All right. Yeah. I mean, do you want to keep going through it or is this, is it, would we feel good? That's, those, those are the appendices now. Yeah. yeah. I don't think we need to review these. Do we have the um, comparative criteria here? Yeah. I thought I had them up, but I don't see them. Um, I downloaded them. Let me, let me I'll just stop sharing. I'll, let me have to just go to, I'm somewhere on my computer. 
So does anyone have any questions about what we've reviewed so far? Questions, comments? Rita, you sent those comparative criteria, right? And yep. I thought I downloaded everything. It was in the same. Uh, yeah. It was in the same email. I don't see. Yeah. John Page, do you have them? I'm not. Um, I don't have it down. I don't have it on my laptop. I'm out of town, so. Hey, John, yeah, if you I have can... them, I, I, you, you can share it. I, I don't know why. <laughs> I can find them. Rita, you didn't make many changes after I sent them to you? Okay. Right. Yeah, here they are. I'll, I'll download them. I don't know why. All right. So, yeah, I can share the screen now. It looks like there's a few. Uh... So, in terms of, um, there is, you know, one. Oh, yeah, John, you. So, there was a question from uh, Tom, is in the audience, and he asked the Belchertown Road site must have 100% affordable. And, uh, John, you said that's right. Is that? It's 100% at 100% AMI. Right. Yeah. Because of the CPA. Right. Position. That's the top. Yeah, where, did, where did the criteria go? <laughs> oh, yeah. There's a lot of documents for this meeting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, to me, this is the, is this uh, visible? Yes. Yeah, all right. Yes. Yeah, I think integrating it would be good. I mean, I think it's a nice, um, nice layout now. Yeah. I mean, basically, if you look at the first row, what we've done here is under advantageous to say, essentially 40 units that are affordable is kind of the minimum. And then highly advantageous would be doing better than that, more than 40 units. Uh, and so Basically, we're leaving it up to the developer to see if they can propose something better in that row. And the same is true for a number of the other rows as well. Yeah, I like the bedroom count. Developer track record. Okay, if anybody has any questions or comments, please stop Nate and say, I want to say something about bedroom counts. Yeah, I, mean, I, I agree. I agree, John. It's just like, you know, more the merrier. So we have our minimum, what's advantageous, and what would be. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, that works for the bidders as, as well as for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, the breakdown. Yeah, I thought this was good. Um, the track record here. I mean, I think there's clearly a, a progression of, you know, like we're saying from unacceptable to highly advantageous. So I think that it's nice to, to see it. All right, I'll just keep, uh, uh, you know, keep uh, moving it. I don't know why that's funny. Uh, the financial feasibility. Would we here have here? Um, you know, we see a minimum of two letters of, of interest or our financial commitment. Would we ever have those have more, you know, more letters be part of the highly advantageous or anything? Um, is that kind of, is that maybe implicit in some of this or? In financial feasibility? Yeah. The, the letters of interest are um, generally pretty, pretty uh, useless, but. <laughs> nice to have, but they don't mean anything. They're they're always qualified. Right. So I, no one's committing at this stage of the game. Right. right. 
important thing to me about this one was that highly advantageous is that the rents are more competitive mm -hmm. than the ones in the just advantageous. Mm -hmm. yeah. Michael, yeah. where are you guys, where are you going? We're going to Lindbergh. Okay, let's move on to the next category. Yeah, we say competitive with market yeah. rents. I mean, would we be off in 15 minutes? Would we say, I mean, we I know the word competitive, but would we say uh, reduced? I mean, I, I know. Do we like the word competitive there? The market rate rents are competitive, very competitive oh, yeah. with Amherst. Rita, you're still you're unmuted. <laughs> you're <laughs> unmuted. <laughs> You gonna, hid yourself, but you didn't. Are you going to go get ice cream in 15 minutes? Oh, yeah. well, <laughs> my, I'm with my grandson, you know, in Minneapolis here. It's precious time. So, I'm oh, yeah, to, really? I'm trying to join them. I, mean, yeah. I was just asking, you know, in the highly advantageous for financial feasibility, we say, um, you know, market rents are very competitive with Amherst market rents. And I mean, I was just saying, do we want to, is competitive the word we want to use, or would we also want to say, like, uh, re reduced or, you know, um, I know, you know, I just. Let's leave it a competitive. Yeah. <laughs> I will say that with some of the new developments, the rents are very high. Yeah. All right, in the schedule. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Any questions or comments? No. Yeah, just let me just. Uh... Yeah, so here's the section where we say what there is to be said about site design. So does that do it for everybody? Yeah, I think it says enough. Okay. I don't know what other people feel. I feel like, you know, I think as, you know, you know, voice monolithic building massing includes mid and low rise building elements. Um, you know, and then if for highly advantageous, a plan for reusing the school. So. This is a new, we broke this out as a separate section, right? It used to be included in development or something or other, and we decided it should have its own section. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it highlights it and basically it's like other rows. What you have under advantageous is that, uh, you know, it does certain things that are consistent with what DHCD expects under its QAP. And then in the next highly advantageous is, can you do better? Mm -hmm. Which I think is a good strategy. The management and maintenance. Uh, 
again, the thing that's new here that you wouldn't necessarily expect to find is the concern about uh, minimizing the number of people who were evicted. And we just, we need to change that um, first sentence, um, John Page, if you would just make a note there, because it said includes a, a, a detailed management and maintenance plan, but that's not what we, that's not consistent with, it's like a sample. Oh. It's an yeah. example. It's an yeah, example. Instead of detail, then, put, in, right. put in the word sample. Okay. I think the other thing we added here was something about not knowing how someone could demonstrate it exactly, but something about good relationship with tenants for the management proposal. Yeah, we talked about that, but it's really hard to um, measure that. <laughs> we know it's hard to measure, but we wanted to say it anyway, I think it's is how it there. came down. So it yeah. It's in there under advantageous. And highly advantageous. And highly advantageous. So it's there, Carol. Yeah. No, I'm saying it was a new, it was right. something yeah. that didn't used to be there that was, yes. Right. Yeah. Just pointing out that that was in there. That's all. Yeah. Handlet and redders with little smiley faces. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think it's nice to have in there. That's interesting because, um, you know, during some of the recent 40B projects, you know, it's, it is asked, you know, it's kind of like that, that kind of qualitative, you know, how is it managed? How's, what's the relationship? And All right. On to the next section. All right, so that's community support and we're moving. One more, I think. How advantageous is a is a high bar there? Well, yeah, I mean, advantageous is can you do what's really required to meet the minimum right. of the law regulation? And highly advantageous is again, are there ways that you think you could do better? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's, that's it. it. That's it. Oh, yep. That's, oh. Rita can go get ice cream. Okay. So, I, I don't know if it was ice cream or not. I, this is great. I, yeah, I, I agree with John. Thanks for, uh, you know, the review, the RFP team and everyone doing this and Rita. I mean, this is really. Now it was a great, as I've said at, at prior meetings, it was a great, great team of people to work with. So yeah, no, it's a really thorough document. So I, I feel like. Thank you. Erica so, Francis and Carol did great work. Yeah. So thank I'm, you, Rita. I am gonna I'm gonna sign off. So <laughs> okay. So our next step is to consider whether to vote to recommend this subject to the few changes we already discussed this evening and the other missing elements that need to be added uh, to the town manager for inclusion in the final RFP. So I will make that motion. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Uh, any discussion or questions? Okay, well then I will call the roll. Uh, me, I, I'm in favor. Allegra? Yes. Sid? Yes. Francis? 
Yes. Uh, I guess Will still hasn't joined us, or has he? Uh, yeah, I haven't seen him as, as an attendee. Okay, Rob? Yes. Erica? Erica? That's a yes. Okay, and Carol is a yes. yes. Okay, yeah. so since the earlier, uh, we are in favor of this seven to zero with two people not available. Okay, so then we can go on to the next agenda item. And we're running a little bit behind, which has to do with looking at inclusionary zoning. There are a number of zoning proposals that are before the planning board and the community resources committee. And in consultation with Nate, we chose one to talk about tonight because I think it has the best chance of adoption in the near future. And that's the bylaw on inclusionary zoning. So at this point, I turn it over to Nate to uh, talk about this. It's a really colorful document here on your screen. <laughs> um, the, um, yeah, so the, uh, let me just make it a little bigger. The town has inclusionary zoning and, uh, you know, if there's a few different zoning changes that are being proposed in terms of, uh, you know, allowing more or different types of new development or, you know, there's accessory dwelling uh, unit changes. And one is this inclusionary zoning. And I think the, the two, I think the, there's probably three big changes to the bylaw. And one is um, right now, the bylaw only applies if you have a special permit for use. So, you know, if it's a by right use or site plan review by the planning board, it doesn't, um, the, the products aren't required to provide affordable units. And then if you have certain dimensional, you waive certain dimensional standards, then you have to provide affordable units. But the changes here in green say that now any residential development, including but not limited to townhouses, apartments, mixed use buildings, um, PERDs or open space developments that provide new units are required to um, you know, trigger this bylaw. So basically it's, it's almost any type of development now would be required to provide affordable units. You know, there are some exceptions here. So like a, you know, a comprehensive permit project, a conventional subdivision or a cluster subdivision, um, fraternities or sororities and institutional uses. Um, so, you know, really it's trying to capture almost any type of development method in town would be required to provide affordable units. And I will say the things offered in or highlighted in green, uh, this is being presented to the community resource committee next week. It was presented to them two or three weeks ago in the planning board a week or so ago, and they had some questions. So, um, you know, we're trying to make this bylaw, I had said something about, if, you know, something about the bylaw being misinterpreted. And I think we're really trying to make this language be very clear in terms of what, you know, what, what it means. And so we're defining new dwelling units as any combination of units that have received a certificate of occupancy and are located in new buildings or addition to buildings. And, you know, we've had different people look at this um, to try to figure out, you know, is there a way that someone could, is there a loophole in this? And so we're trying to you know, make it just, you know, kind of really clear. Um, you know, the percent of units doesn't change. So, you know, if it's under 10 units, you're not required. If it's 10 to 14 units, you have to have one affordable unit, you know, 15 to 20 uh, new units, you have two affordable units. And if it's over 21 new units, you have 12% of the units are affordable. And so, you know, we're not, we're not proposing to change that. Um, uh, one, one new change is actually with the affordable units, you know, we have it at 80% area median income. So if, if a developer keeps the units at 80% area median income, it's too expensive for voucher holders. So we've put this, we're proposing this new provision that when six or more affordable units are required, 20% of them have to be reserved for 60% AMI or less. So that's a new provision. So it's, you know, requiring a lower, a lower percentage of, um, you know, income. Why? Hey, Nate, sorry if I missed this. Do we have a payment in lieu of units for developments yeah, that are smaller? 
that's at the end. end. Yeah. Oh, okay. But yeah, so I think the 60%, you know, this was discussed. I think, you know, I think some people will like this and some people may push back against this as a, you know, requiring too low of a, of an income, but, uh, you know, the thought right, the staff's thought right now is, you know, the standard definition of affordable doesn't, you know, excludes a lot of different households in Amherst from getting into units. So, um, and then here we're defining residential development as a new one means, you know, new dwelling units on one or more properties uh, developed at the same time or within five years and the share aspects, um, you know, like shared utilities or common driveway or lot or building coverage. And, um, you know, the, the purpose for this is there's a few developers who own properties adjacent to each other. And if someone asked at the planning board meeting, could they essentially phase a development and only do nine units at a time and then be exempt from this bylaw? And <laughs> as strange as that sounds, um, Not strange we, had at someone, all. we had someone ask that seriously. Um, a developer asked that if they could get around the bylaw by, um, by kind of doing this phasing. And so Northampton and other communities do have this kind of this, you know, this qualification of having, you know, a product that if it's phased, it's still captured as one development. Uh, so that's good. Yeah, that's, that's, that's more recent change. And then Francis, to your question, um, the bylaw at the end of the, the bylaw had originally, if you had four or more units and half the units were on site, you had the provision of providing offsite units or a payment in lieu of. And this, this vacancy right here, this empty spot, 170, we're proposing to delete the provision of offsite units. It just seemed somewhat inconsistent with the message of the inclusionary zoning bylaw, um, but we are keeping this payment in lieu of. Oh man, that's the one I hate. Well, it's- four, I don't like it. But listen, Can I so give- here, here, here it is, if you have six or more affordable units, so that's a 46 unit development. So it has to be at least 46 new units. It would be required to have six affordable. And then if half of those are provided on site, the developer may request through a special permit that they make a payment in lieu of uh, for those three units. And at four times the current median family income, that's um, over 300,000, that's about $300,000, $310,000 per unit. So that means a developer would be making almost a million dollar contribution to the trust. That's really cool. But if they just used up the place that it's possible to build houses in, what are you going to do with the money you just got? Well, so yeah. I just think, I mean, that's, I'm just saying, I, I don't, you don't need to argue about it, but that's no, no, no. My, my concern is that what happens is you get a bunch of money and you got no place, no place to use it. It, it, was, it was so, so hard, hard to, to find, find the places, places that we, that we already have, have found. found. Anyway, anyway, that's, that's my, my complaint. complaint. That's a really good point, though. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I think that um, I'm curious if you've thought, you know, if there's less than six units or if it's less than 10 units, there's an option for payment in lieu. But then, like, after a certain number, it's required units because, like Carol said, well, even if you get a lot of money, it's so hard to, and it just takes longer, right? It's just like another day, another year without. Right. I, th I think the, um, you know, this isn't, this is by a special permit. So I think the developer would have to make the case why they couldn't provide those units on site. And so, you know, it's a discretionary piece. It's, a, you know, essentially it's going beyond, you know, if the project was a buy right project, the developer would then actually have to then apply for a special permit through the planning board to try to get this provision in place. So I think it's a pretty rigorous process. Um, I agree. I think you know it's better to get the units um, built with a project. You know, when the town hired a consultant a few years ago, and a number of bylaws, you know, Cambridge, Brookline, they have at least one kind of uh, relief for the developer, whether it's you know, offsite units or a payment in lieu of, or uh, sometimes they might have, you know, a, a pretty significant density bonus, but, uh, you know, we, the town already through its zoning allows pretty generous build out of property. So, uh, you know, we're not providing a density bonus here. I think it's already kind of built into the bylaw, but so, you know, Carol, I, I know what you're saying. I think the, the, the thought too would be if, if, 
six or more affordable units are required and they are, it's four times the median income, hopefully it's enough money that the trust could leverage it to get more, you know, at least the same number or more units, affordable units developed. And I know that's uh, not the same as having it in a development, but. Um, I'd rather, I personally would rather get rid of buying your way out of it and let you put the unit somewhere else. Then you still have the housing. But, you know, I don't know. People came up with this and I'm just got to say what I think. So we can go on. So would you want to, would you like the provision of offsite units then better than the payment in lieu of? Absolutely. You still get the units. They're somewhere. They're not, they're, not, they're, they're in, in Amherst. Amherst. But yeah, then you'd have to, sorry, go on. Well, I mean, I I, mean, I, I don't know. I mean, we talked about that. The difficulty the there is. I mean, we, we just, just bought a property, property for a million dollars on Melton Town Road. Road. Oh, so, right. not a million, not a million dollars. dollars. We, there, there are ways we could use, use it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Just thinking if Why there's a... Yeah, there's an echo. Is that a... Sorry, I think that's me. I just wanted to say quickly, if there is a um, off-site provision, then there should be uh, criteria of where that is so that it's not in like the worst place possible so you know in an area that is commiserate with the characteristics of where the other units are going yeah, the, the, the offsite provision was within the same zoning district or within 500 feet of the property and i mean i guess the difficulty there that we ran into is um well when we discussed with staff is essentially the developer if they were proposing that they would have to then go through a whole other permitting process to guarantee those units possibly or buy a property. And so they're permitting for the current development that would be you know, part of this inclusionary zoning, we would not approve it until they could come back with proof that they have the ability to do those other offsite units, which that could be like a year to do that because you know, we wouldn't, the building commission was like, I wouldn't wanna grant this land use permit to this type of development because what if a developer has to then go buy another property and to renovate three units or whatever, it's it's really I, I mean it's really um, you know it gets more complicated than just allowing it. So, but I did make the note, Carol, of the provision of offsite units could be better than a payment in lieu of. Um, I think it's you know a discussion to be had with the planning board and CRC. Also, the offsite units. Thank you. Um, at least when I, when. You know, when I wrote this, it was intended for um, potentially providing ownership opportunities on the edges of downtown. If there were, if there was a rental development made in downtown, if you could buy a house that's right off, right outside of downtown and you're going to make it a, uh, an affordable ownership opportunity, that that would be a, a good trade-off. Huh. That's not the way it was written, though, Rob. So it wasn't, wasn't the way it was written, but it was that was the intent. That's interesting. I like that intent. I like that too. Yeah, I mean, I'd hope would be that. Um, you know, this as a special permit, essentially that, you know, there'd be a, a high enough bar that it's actually not a sought after alternative. You know, you want to make it a little bit challenging for a developer because otherwise you won't get the units right in the development. Um, it's interesting, Rob, you're saying the buy, even with buying the property, whether or not that was happening, you know, I think the town would really hesitate to provide a permit for this for the original project if a developer hadn't owned didn't have site control on the property where the units would be built. So, I mean, I almost feel like the offsite units is really tricky, and there's been a few cases where, right, they were permitted and never actually, you know, they never actually were finished. And so, uh, yeah. it's almost like you want to have you'd almost want to say before you get a sea of a certificate of occupancy for this first project the other offsite units have to be ready to be occupied too. And so, I mean, there's probably a way, I, you know, so if, if we like that provision, we can probably have some better language about how to make it work. Um,
I think the way it was written before is just um, it didn't have some of those, those conditions. So essentially, you know, it's, it would become up to the permit granting authority, like, oh, what's the what's the rationale? But if the if the bylaw actually said provision of offsite units, you know, within the same zoning district or 500 feet, and they must have a certificate of occupancy at the same time as whatever project or something and cr created some some condition there. Um, all right. So I do think that, you know, the planning board was, you know, they had questions about this offsite provision and this kind of last section about some of the income limits or set asides. Um, and the, the community resource committee of the town council, like I said, is reviewing it and they had a few questions, but for the most part, I think they really want to uh, support these changes. You know, I think they're looking forward to trying to get this, um, you know, recommended to town council to be an official zoning amendment that then would go through the hearing and adoption process. So, you know, if the, if the housing trust, if you have more questions, you can, in the next week, you can send, you know, comments individually to me. Um, but I think, you know, probably in the next month or so, this will probably, you know, be in a form where town council would, would see it. Great. I That's think good. that both the planning board and the community resources committee intend to discuss this uh, in the next so uh, one to three weeks. I'm not, quite sure exactly the schedule. Right. So um, uh, one of the things I thought we should have is a, a something to say that says we approve of this bylaw. I mean, the only issue that's been raised, and it's a good one, raised by Carol and supported by others, that uh, there's some question about whether the payment in lieu should be the only option but whether there should be even a preferred option about providing units in either rental units that are nearby or even affordable home ownership units as Rob has suggested. Now, I actually did speak to the planning board a week or so ago, and I did send you a copy of my comments. Uh, they had less to do with the detail like what we've just been discussing um, but more to the fact that we needed a blanket inclusionary zoning bylaw because just to go back to what I said then, what we have now is essentially an exclusionary bylaw. And so the change that uh, Nate and the planning department have made are really important. And I don't think we should kind of stand mute for another month until we meet again. Uh, I think it's important for us to weigh in. So I can take what I drafted and I did send it out. I don't know if anybody has any comments on it and say that we're in favor of the bylaw, except that we would prefer that developers uh, try to use uh, all of the required units either on site or nearby or potentially uh, at another location in town where they would allow for home ownership. And obviously Nate can craft that language better than I have because he's been involved in crafting all of this. But that would be uh, my suggestion for what we should do. Because as I said, I, I'm not comfortable just leaving it uh, for another month. I guess I'd also want to know, you know, what the trust thinks about the kind of the set aside, you know, 20% of the units at 60% area median income, if that's. And my personal preference would be to push that up to 50%, at least at 60% uh, area median income. Any other thoughts about that issue? I think it's a good it's a good to have it there whether it's 20 percent or 50 percent some something in there um, seems good to me yeah, yeah. I, I I agree um, was there any like study done prior to look at what the you know like the development costs would be to add a higher affordability level higher affordability lower. Yeah. 
or the, whatever. Sorry, like uh, increasing the affordability and the number of units. Uh, no, not. I mean, we had we had a consultant a few years ago. You know, did some some computations, but for this change, these changes, we haven't you know done. A I think that's where amount. the that's where the tax incentive financing opportunity comes in. If yeah, sure. developers offering deeper affordability, then they can apply to the town manager for that kind of subsidy. Right, yes, no, that works well. Well, well John, is a strategy to put in 50 and And when it gets reviewed by the planning board and the CRC, then there's an opportunity to negotiate. If you already start low, they may want it lower. Right, they'll take it from 20 to zero. I think they'll keep at least 20. I think, I think 50 is high. Um, essentially then we're changing our definition of what an affordable <laughs> unit is, um, which is, you know, we're saying is an 80% AMI. That's actually a thing I couldn't find. I, want, I, I looked at this thing at the beginning. It says, um, ensuring that new residential development generates affordable housing as defined in Article 12. I tried to find Article 12. I did, but I never found the definition of affordable housing. housing. I think if you, right, so Article 12 of the zoning bylaw is the definition section. I think if you went to housing, it's, I think it's housing comma affordable. <laughs> uh, all right. Section. So it's 80%. Is that what it says, Nate? It is. Yeah. Up to 80%. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm going to just read quickly what I said to the planning board. Mm -hmm. It's probably about two minutes. Yes, uh, please. So we can see if anybody has a concern about this. Uh, why do we need to change this bylaw? Right now, we have a de facto exclusionary zoning bylaw. New developments in Amherst typically come at a rental price of $1,900 a month for a one bedroom and $3,000 a month for a two bedroom. We should hang a sign across Pleasant Street downtown saying, quote, no low income persons allowed here, unquote. As most everyone knows, we have become a town where if you are not well compensated or wealthy, you cannot afford to move here. Many people will tell you that they could not afford to buy the home they now own. Leaving the student population aside, we have become a community of older white persons. The numbers of families with children have been dropping very significantly since the year 2000. The revised bylaw will not change this overnight, but it will provide it a much needed nudge in a different direction. With a more inclusive inclusionary zoning bylaw, lower income households will have at least a 10% chance of being able to rent in downtown Amherst. Uh, last night, we sponsored a forum on creating a path to home ownership. The highlight of the evening was a presentation by three homeowners who live in affordable homes. For those of, well, I'll skip over that. Um, if, if you listen to what they had to say, it's very moving. Let's take down the sign which stretches across Pleasant Street announcing no low income persons allowed here. It's a blot on our community. We need affordable housing and passing this revised bylaw will contribute significantly toward that goal. Amherst is a town that values equity, fairness and diversity. Let's live up to these values. Thank you for your attention. That's a so, yeah. fantastic letter. Here, here. Okay, I could add to that oh, the fact that we would like to see, um, in instead of the emphasis on payment in lieu, uh, a provision that would allow or or that would uh, require units, as many units as possible on site, and if off site, uh, nearby, or if a little further away, then uh, units that could be for affordable home ownership. Yeah, I, I would like to add that. And maybe it's since it's a thing that they have asked about, it would be useful to say that we do support including 
a percentage that is at 60%. And for our, from our point of view, it could be higher than 20, but not lower. Okay. Okay, so uh, I'll put forward a motion to amend the note that I've already sent, send the new note uh, to both the CRC and the planning board um, with those changes that we've just discussed. Is there a sure, second? So Sorry, Nate. Second. So th this is what the provision had site uh, said, offsite affordable units may be allowed uh, for projects in the BG, BBC, BN or BL districts. So those are like the downtown districts um, or village center districts. And I said offsite units shall be located within the same zoning district or within 500 feet. And I think, you know, with some of those other, the language we had tonight, we can change, we could, you know, modify that provision. Okay, so we'll do a roll call vote then, unless there's further discussion. Uh, we just quick question, would, would the trust not recommend the payment in lieu of or would you want to keep that in there? I'd like it if it was gone, but I don't think that I speak for everyone. Did I see that chopping? Did I see your cho the chopping motion? Take, just, <laughs> just take it right off. <laughs> I would I would recommend it for those that are probably under six units. You know, like if you're building more than. I don't know. It's like I don't I don't know where the cutoff would be, but if you're building five units, you could still put a little something in the jar for affordable housing, you know. Um, and then I see sometimes there's like if it's less than you know eight units or something, then it's an option to do either either. But if it's greater than that, then like it must be. Um, you have to build the units. Like you can't just pay your way out of it. Well, again, we can say we have a preference for people building the units rather than pay their way out of it. As you just expressed, Francis. A strong preference. <laughs> Thanks okay. to Carol for starting. <laughs> yeah, it is interesting though. I've, that, right, I've seen, I have seen other bylaws write that cap it. And so there's a window at which these, um, these are allowed, you know, these other options. So you're not, you know, you're not, you know, essentially if a developer, for instance, Aspen Heights had 11 affordable units. So, you know, they could have then said, oh, well, you know, we have, we're providing more units. We want, you know, we want half our, we want five or six units to not be provided in the project. And we want to do something else with those. We could pay, pay them or, you know, have them off site. So, um, it's actually interesting, the bigger developer you have, the bigger development, it's actually easier <laughs> to get units in there. It's almost the smaller ones that might have a harder time. Yeah. So yeah, no, I think, yeah, let me, I made a note of that too. Let me just, I'll, I can look at the wording. Well, that's probably the reason for having, uh, or to me, that's the reason for having some kind of out is that if it's so hard to create affordable units, if you're building, something that only has 10 units from everything that I've heard about getting financing, you can't get financing for something that small to make it affordable. So what are you gonna do? So if there's some way, I don't, I don't know how putting it somewhere else gives you any more hope, but I guess that that's the reason why it's, it's helpful to have some kind of way out. We don't want it to be, become impossible to build a 10, 10 units because there's no way to make one of them affordable. So I, I kind of get that. So it, the, thing that, the thing that Francis is saying about some, if it gets big enough, if it gets big enough to be financeable, then you have to put your units in there, I think. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, no, anyway, no, I, I like what John, in, in order to not keep talking about this forever yeah. right now, maybe it's good to just say what John said. Our preference is that you don't get to buy your way out of it. And then whoever is redrafting it, which is probably Nate, gets to try to figure out how to make all this make sense again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we're ready for a vote. Uh, and again, I'll uh, ask everybody, all those in favor, Carol? Yes. Uh, Erica? Yes. 
Strong preference. Uh, great. Um, Rob? Yes. Francis? Yes. Sid? Yes. Allegra? Yes. And I'm in favor. So again, that gets us seven votes, I believe. Okay, so we're ready to move on to the next agenda item. And now we're running really late, so I got to decide what to do. Uh, the next item that I had on the agenda had to do with a review of the most recent draft of the comprehensive planning policy or housing policy that's been drafted by the Community Resources Committee. And again, I wrote a set of comments that were mostly not favorable to the draft. Carol had written a set of comments earlier and both of those have been shared. Um, I tried to incorporate Carol's comments into what I wrote, which I think I did successfully. Um, but the question is, as a housing trust, uh, are we ready to go forward with this or should we delay it till the next month? I'll say, I think the CRC, they haven't, you know, they had uh, discussed it a month ago and then they were going to pick it up, but with all the zoning changes, I think they've prioritized looking at the zoning amendments and not the policy. So there's probably time for the trust to delay a discussion. Um, but I do think the CRC had wanted um, community or committee comments uh, in the month of April, I think on the, on the housing policy. So I don't, you know, we aren't necessarily meeting again in April, but. Um, well, I can submit these draft comments that haven't been reviewed. So at least it gets their attention. Yeah, I was gonna pull them up, John. I had, I had them. They aren't too lengthy. It's only a couple of pages. Only a couple of pages, huh? I believe so, yes. Yeah, no, I don't, it's not opening for me. Do you have it, John? You could read it if it's just a couple pages. Well, it's a little bit, let me see. I think it's harder to read than the thing that I just read. Okay. So I could, uh, I could send it to you quickly, Nate. It should show up right away. No, I have it. It's just, um, oh. For some reason, it's not um, it's not opening on my screen. I don't know why it's not. Uh, I don't see it anywhere. I would could try to share it. I've never successfully shared a document. I'm not quite there. sure. Yeah, I don't know why it's not opening for me. What do I do to share a screen? I hit share screen. Hit share screen. And then if you have the, the document has to be open, but- um, Yes, it is open. Yeah. I don't know where mine is. Uh, well, it's open, but it's not sitting in the- Maybe I can move it into that space. Nope. Yeah, I don't, geez. I don't know why mine isn't opening. It's. My computer doesn't like your comments, John. Not. <laughs> I have your inclusionary zoning ones, but not housing policy. Well, it was <sighs> sent to everybody with the, uh, my original list of things that would be included. All right, I was able to open it. So um, I do think the um, the document is really thorough from Can we see that the uh, these are John's comments, I believe. Yeah, I can try to paraphrase them quickly. Um, 
basically there are 51 strategies organized under five rubrics. First of all, I don't say this, but it's ridiculous that they have 51 strategies that have been scooped out of a bunch of other documents and don't really indicate what's a priority and what's a, not a priority. To the extent that they do that, almost all of them are listed as high priority. There are a few that are medium priority and a, uh, about the same small number that are low priority. Uh, not surprisingly, all the ones that relate to affordable housing are low priority or pretty much all of those. So everything else is more important to the CIC than that. They also talk loosely about affordable housing, but what is affordable housing is never properly defined. There's one brief place where they allude to uh, less than 100% of area median income, but there's no discussion of 80%, 60%, 30%, or other the thing, the kinds of things that we try to use when we're thinking about affordable housing. Uh, let's see. I think, let's see. Um, what else do I want to add? Whoops. I hit the wrong thing. Yep. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I've hit the real highlights, frankly, the fact that they treat uh, the low prior, the low priority areas are identifying and creating additional funding for the housing trust, affordable home units, and affordable rentals. Those are three out of their four low priority items. Uh, another issue which Carol pointed out is that uh, there's discussion of increasing housing density downtown and in village centers but there's no real discussion about linking increased density to greater affordability. Uh, they also talk about improving access to home ownership to persons who are black, indigenous, and persons of color, but there's no discussion about how this is gonna be achieved or frankly, virtually anything else. Uh, they quote the master plan and say the presence of higher education institutions in Amherst has a significant impact on the character of the town's population as well as its housing needs. And then absolutely nothing more is said about the role of UMass. And as we know, the university is home to about 28,000 students with only 13,500 uh, residential beds on campus. It, they just ignore it. Uh, nothing more is said. There's a little bit of a section on measurables and deliverables, but it's frankly quite incomplete. And it's an area where they could use existing data to say, okay, if we wanna make changes, here's where we are today. They don't do that. Uh, they really make no reference whatever to existing data. Whereas that's important. You gotta define what the problem is to be able to talk about where you wanna go. So I think that's a quick summary of what I said in the draft. Uh, and uh, I'll leave it at that. John, could you um, remind me, or I guess I don't really know, but what um, what the impact of this, that their, this plan will be on no. all things housing? It's unclear, Francis. To be honest, it'll probably sit on a shelf and no one will pay attention to it because he has all guess. these strategies that have come from prior plans that nobody has dealt with. On the other hand, what I really don't like about it is the fact that it defines affordable housing, uh, at least as we consider it, to be such a low priority. And I feel like we just can't let that go even if I know the end report is just gonna sit on a shelf somewhere. So, yeah. For, can I just insert one thing is, I, I've been confused by this all along and I think we just need to ask the chair. I think the priorities were placeholders 
And I found that incredibly confusing. They have not assigned priority to any objective is what I heard in the last meeting. So I think we need to ask whether those are placeholders. And if they are so, that's very confusing and they need to be removed. I don't think they've assigned priority to any yet, but maybe I'm completely wrong in that. Well, yeah, they have, as I said, high priority assigned to uh, probably two thirds or more of the 51 strategies. How would they send out a draft that has all these things about priorities and not at least write something at the top that says these are just place? It's very I weird. Agree. And maybe it's completely, can, you might, I don't know. It's crazy. Then they'd ask for feedback on something that they haven't even made sense out of. I'll say, Francis, to your question, you know, John and the trust had talked about, I mean, this is a, I mean, a year and a half or so ago of having a, a document that defined affordability, defined priorities for the town. Uh, whether it's the number of units generated, uh, types of units, mix of units, and then that document would be shared by the planning board, uh, you know, zoning board, CPA committee, so that when a project comes you know, after funding or is getting permitted, the ZBA can say, okay, you know, if someone needs inclusionary zoning or is required to provide affordable units, what, you know, what are the conditions we'd place on those units? Like, is there an AMI that we would target or unit sizes? And because, you know, what we're seeing is that it was, there were so many different ideas of what was needed for affordable units. So to kind of just have a, a unifying statement. And then the CRC took it on as a housing policy. And I, I, I mean, to me as a policy, it's very long. You know, it has right, all these strategies, it's 15 pages. To me, a policy is a page, right? It's a policy statement or something. Uh, it could be a few paragraphs, but not, I mean, I think they did a really good job of synthesizing all the reports and studies we have and actually outlining the strategies that we could be using. But I don't, to me, that's really detailed for a policy. Um, so I think to me, that was the thought of what the policy would do. It just help everyone understand what is, you know, what are the priorities? So even if the town's asking for money to, you know, for capital planning for housing, okay, what is, what, you know, what, is, what do we mean by affordable housing? Or um, maybe it's not coming through in this document then. It's not. Yeah. Another thing I'll say is to the extent there's any discussion of implementation of these strategies, something like 80 to 90% of the time, it says the planning uh, department will figure it out. <laughs> would, it be, um, <laughs> would it be possible to have somebody from that committee come and speak to us and you know we can tell them like they can tell us what the what it is and we can give them our feedback that way too yeah i mean staff we we began to discuss this with the crc like i said a month ago and we didn't get very far um and then there's you know we haven't revisited it with them so i, I think that they're um I think that they're still working on it themselves before they might go out, you know, to present it to other committees. I think, you know, because it's a public document, we can look at it. Um, I mean, John, I think maybe we would continue this to next month and then we could just encourage the CRC not to, you know, take any, any positions on it until the trust has reviewed it again. Well, I, I could send them the draft that I have and say that the trust will be considering it again next month. And if anybody from the CRC wants to come and discuss it with us, they're specifically invited. Mm -hmm. We'll give them at least three minutes. I would I need more with so many priorities. <laughs> 50 priorities. I would really like, I don't know if I can move, but I would like John's letter to go to them because there are so many things that are, I'd like it to go now not so why wait for them to get further into their process when there's so many things that it seems like and, and and so if what they say back is oh those are only placeholder priorities we didn't really mean it that way we meant this yours or tops that's cool that's great but what i can't see any reason not to let them know how unsatisfactory what they have done so far is to what we think is important well as i said carol i can if people agree uh, we don't even necessarily have to formally agree as long as there appears to be a consensus. I can send the draft to them and say they're invited to come to the next meeting when it will be discussed again and to better represent perhaps than I have. 
what the thinking is. I like that idea. Okay, it looks like uh, people are generally okay with that. Does anybody have a problem with that? Okay, I hate to ask you all to get further into the guts of this document because <laughs> it's not fun. No, it's not. Uh, but again, you're all invited to do that. Okay, let's try to move on to another item as we're getting, we're starting to close in on nine o'clock. And I thank you for your indulgence. Uh, Let's see. Okay. Uh, I, I've got a couple of items. Well, I just briefly mentioned, we, we talked about financing of the trust. I think, as I said last time, we did not get a support for uh, technical assistance uh, grant from Mass Housing Partnership. So we've got to go it alone. Um, we can talk oh, next time about forming a subcommittee so people can think if, about whether they're interested in being part of a subcommittee that looks at future financing. Uh, and that'll be on the agenda next time. Uh, I'm going to skip over state legislation. We can come back to that next time because there's not going to be a vote between now and our May meeting, I don't think. Uh, most of that are non-budget items, or they're all non-budget items. Uh, the Home Ownership Forum. I just wanted to briefly mention that. Uh, first of all, I want to say Francis did an excellent job of moderating that meeting for which I- Here, here, yes. Oh, John, you did an amazing job putting it all together, and Carol did incredible, too, just yeah, keeping Carol time. And, <laughs> and John Page was keeping track of uh, when people wanted to make comments, although that was partly use handicap, let's put it that way, without saying any further. Um, we hope that all of that goes better for our next forum, which will be on racial equity and housing. It's scheduled for Tuesday, April 20th. So it's about 10 days away. Uh, I believe I have a moderator for that meeting. Uh, uh, Solda Ortega Bustamante earlier today agreed to be the moderator. I probably still need a timekeeper and someone to keep track of what's going on in the chat or people are raising their hands so that we can allow some audience participation. Uh, you, have, you have the chat function now. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Nate's figure. Great, right. <laughs> thank you, Nate. Okay, it was buried. so does anyone who want to volunteer to be timekeeper? I have something else at that time, so I okay. can't do it this time. Sorry. Well, I can try and find somebody else um, who's prepared. And that's when it's my second vaccine. Okay. <laughs> on, that, on that time. Okay, John, are you expecting to attend? I should be there. I can I can do it. I don't like to interrupt people, but I can I can well you can at least. It. Keep track of the chat and I'll see if I can yeah, find somebody who's willing, willing to interrupt. interrupt. I can, I'm happy to interrupt. <laughs> you can, John, you can just write, you have two minutes left. You can just do it through the chat function. You don't have to. Uh... Well, people may not see it don't that see way. the chat. Uh, yeah. yeah. I guess I could also try to recruit Meg Gage. She did a terrific job when the league yeah. had held there for him. Uh, Meg's a friend. If she's available, she'd probably do it. Um, Francis said she'd do it. Francis said she'd do it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Fine. Great. I'm sure you'll do an excellent job. Uh, okay. Well, I, I can do May 25th. Okay. I'll be done with my vaccine. Yeah, we'll see if May 25th is going to actually come off. But thanks, Erica. So far, that's been a difficult group to get together. 
theoretically, I have my first meeting with two people on Friday. We'll see how that goes. Um, the one other thing I wanted to mention and uh, actually, actually briefly talk about, uh, although I don't know the details of this, but the town manager is planning on appointing a committee of persons to look into finding a permanent home for the seasonal homeless shelter. Um, I believe the person on town staff who will be heading or staffing the committee is Mary Beth uh, Uglowitz, who is the uh, manager of the senior center. Uh, Mary Beth's a great person to do this. I think she's very well organized and knowledgeable. Um, I don't know exactly who he's going to appoint, but I did have a, a note from him asking who the trust would want to have appointed as a member. And I have a specific person in mind, as Allegra knows. Uh, so I'm not absolutely sure that she's willing to volunteer. And I also wanted to ask if anybody else would be interested in participating in that committee. So Allegra, Can you say who your person is? Yeah, I, I, I sort of said. OK. And I certainly would be interested. Great. OK, that's great. I think Allegra is probably the person who's most knowledgeable about issues related to the population of homeless persons among us. So I'm really pleased that she's willing to do that. And I will report Great. that to the town manager. And hopefully he will get back to us at the point at which he's ready to uh, actually appoint this committee. Uh, I think George Ryan is going to be on it based on a conversation I had with him a couple of weeks ago, but I'm not absolutely sure. So at least he'd be on there representing town council. And I'm guessing that Kevin Noonan would be on it and maybe Jerry Weiss. Uh, we'll see what falls out. Okay, so we're just about at nine o'clock. Uh, are there any public comments from the two remaining attendees? Either Mora or Pat, I see are still on the list. I thank you both for attending and the other folks who have uh, attending before. Any other last comments from any of the housing trust members? Okay, I think we've had a really good discussion tonight of a number of important issues and we'll move ahead and look forward to our May meeting. Again, thank you all for your participation. Thank you for organizing us all. <laughs> <laughs> I do my best. Oh, I forgot I skipped over minutes because we don't have uh, March minutes yet. And it turns out uh, John Page assured me that we actually had uh, already re reviewed and approved all other outstanding minutes at our last meeting. So we're in pretty good shape. We'll catch up with March when we meet in May. Okay. Okay. Thanks again.